Welcome to Science Night. It should be really awesome. There's really cool speakers tonight, and of course, at your leisure, grab some food if possible, and see the uh, science fair boards, projects, displays, as we call them. It should be awesome. Um, I'm going to go right out of the program here. Dr. Tyson Swetman. Uh, Dr. Swetman is a forestry and landscape echo-hydrologist. He currently uses remote sensing satellite data and on-the-ground measurements to figure out how landscapes work and how plants and hydrology are related. They must be because plants and water go together. Um, Dr. Swetman's work is very integrative. There are elements of engineering, math, computer programming, physics, chemistry, and biology in all of his works. Tonight, please welcome Dr. Swetman. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Just like we're gonna get going. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I'm giving a Prezi instead of a PowerPoint. So hopefully nobody gets car sick or air sick. Um, I'm gonna talk about the research that I do and um, I'm gonna go through some of my background. So let's see if this is gonna work. So I grew up in Tucson and as a kid I like to watch PBS, nature shows, and science fiction. I watched a lot of TV, and I played a lot of video games. Um, when I got older, I went to college at the U of A. I played rugby. And during the summers, I was a wildland firefighter. So I'd go out and fight fires here in southern Arizona, and then later on in the summer, we'd go around the western US putting out fires. Um, when I was firefighting, I decided that I wanted to become a scientist. So I came back to the U of A for my master's and my PhD. and um, I've been able to do that pretty successfully now for the last 10 years, and I still get to coach the U of A rugby team. So this was the very first computer video game that I got. It was called Wing Commander, and you guys can see the awesome graphics. I think this thing was uh, 400 pixels by 320 pixels, and it came on five floppy disks. I think when it was installed, it was five megabytes. And so you fast forward 25 years to today, and the same guys that made Wing Commander just kicked off the largest crowdsourced uh, project ever. So they called this thing Star Citizen, they got $100 million. And that's the graphics right here. The, there's probably more information on this screen than there was in the entire first game. Um, so we've come a long way in a quarter century. So I'm going to go over um, what I'm going to talk about, how computers are advancing science, um, talk about how we use lasers to do science, the stuff that we all want to learn about drones, um, but we're all a little afraid of still. And then I'll go over the research that I do with eco-hydrology, um, some stuff related to carbon dynamics, and then also uh, even solar energy. So when we look at this photograph, or excuse me, this drawing, most of us see a bunny eating a carrot and some birds and maybe a fern in the corner. But what happens after you go to college is that you start to realize there's all this math that runs around behind it. And so I'm going to actually talk about a few of these equations. I tried to keep the equations short for tonight. But math can explain a lot of things in nature and it's pretty elegant and it doesn't take up a lot of space to do that. But it's a little scary when you first look at it. And my advice to you guys is don't be scared. So science paradigms. Paradigm is kind of a big word, but um, it's a way of explaining examples of how we used to think about things. So thousands of years ago, uh, cavemen used to look at their environment and wonder, well, how do, you, how do you catch that big old ox? And they developed archery equipment to bring it down. And later on, the Greeks thought about the five elements and they use those to explain how the universe works. And so when we talk about things like natural law, you have people like Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, who they say natural, but what they really mean is physics and math. So when we think about nature and ecosystems, we can still think about those in the same way we think about um, how gravity works and how air flows. And so we, we move forward for hundreds of years, and Isaac Newton develops his theorem, and then only in the last 75 years, we've started to use computers. And so some of you guys might have seen the imitation game, but that's Alan Turing, and that's the bomb, 
It was the first, the first computer to break the Nazi code. And so when we get all the way up till today, we have computers now that are very, very fast, and they can do lots and lots of things. And so we can use these computers to expand the way that we think about science. And so one word I think you're going to hear a lot of in the next 10 or 20 years is the term data scientist. So there's people now that their whole job is just to work with data. And there's people that are creative with data, that they think about how to visualize it and how to manipulate it. There are developers that figure out how to move this stuff around. And there are researchers that are always trying to figure out the best way to do that so that we can make it happen faster and faster. And so you guys all know what hackers are, but you never really think about using your math or all the experience you build up over time to try and find that niche inside of data science. So another term that you guys may not have heard of that you're going to hear a lot of in the next few years is something called cyber infrastructure. And cyber infrastructure is a way of explaining how we use computers. These are the supercomputers at the U of A to move data, to mine data, and to figure out new ways to do science. Um, I'm not going to read this list, but this is just an uh, example of all the different departments and colleges at the U of A that are using cyber infrastructure already. The U of A has uh, a dedicated cyber infrastructure called Cybers. It used to be called iPlant, and it was funded by the National Science Foundation for, I think it was $50 million the first time and another $50 million the second time. Um, and they've used that money to develop ways of uh, mapping genomics in plants. But they've expanded that to more of the earth science realm, which is why they, part of the reason why they rebranded their name. But you guys can go on cybers.org and learn all about it and see how, how the U of A is using cyber stuff. Okay, so I'm going to get closer to the stuff that I work on. Um, I use lasers that we call uh, light detection and range, or LIDAR. And you can use these lasers on a terrestrial platform, so this is a scanner that you set up on a tripod and you turn it on with a laptop and it spins around and it takes millions of points and it makes a 3D model of that area. You can do it from an aircraft and that aircraft has a GPS in it so it knows where the aircraft is and how fast it's moving and it scans the surface. Or you can do it from space and you can do things like resolve the height of all the trees on the planet or the depth of the ice in Antarctica. And then you can pair these different things together. So this is a, a model of a tree that they made from a terrestrial scan. And the terrestrial scan, the points are so small that you have multiple points inside of a single leaf. Um, when you fly from an aircraft, the points are about the size of a baseball or a basketball. And then if you're doing it from space, it's probably about the size of a baseball diamond. So this, this laser technology, it's just getting bigger and faster, and there's a lot more ways to look at it. And so Already we have LiDAR that shoots in uh, the red band of the electromagnetic spectrum and the near-infrared. And so when you put those together, you can make fake color photographs. Um, it collects a lot of data. It's hard to see on the projector, but it's very dense. Um, and I was going to pull it out, but I forgot. I have a, a Google Tango tablet. So this tablet has a laser in it, and it can shoot the area that you're sitting in or if you walk down a hallway and so they it's the same technology that they use in the Xbox Connect and so that laser builds a 3D environment and Google does this because they want to see inside of all of our buildings and our homes so that they know which room you're sitting in and which side of the room you're sitting in um, but it's it's a neat way to, to make 3D models just by holding things in your hand and the technology is uh, so fast now that you can resolve a penny so that the depth of a penny, you can take a laser and, and um, map a very small area very quickly. And then further on out there, there's going to be white light lasers that they call um, hyperspectral or supercontinuum lasers. And these things see in all the different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so if any of you have ever done mass spectroscopy in chemistry lab, where you put a little vial in a machine and then it tells you what was in that test tube, this laser, you can shoot it at a leaf, and it will tell you what the elemental composition is of that leaf. And so when you think about this with that, it means that we can map entire forests, and we can tell how much of different elements that those forests are made of. 
And so there's groups like the Carnegie Institute at Stanford that have already begun to do this. Okay, so I'm going to need help in a second starting this video. Um, but when we talk about 3D mapping, we're not just limited to using lasers. So we can do it just taking multiple photographs. So I went out with my new digital camera and I took pictures of this rock work that they've done in our new building. And so I stood right here and then I put the camera over my head and then I moved to a couple different positions and took more photographs. And can we go ahead and press play? And so the software takes those 100 photos and it stitches it together and it can make a 3D model for me. And it does that in about 20 minutes. So we can do that. And then I've got a couple more examples that I'm going to need help with. So this is the courtyard of our new building. And this was about 100 photographs and it took about 45 minutes to, to put together. So I just walked around the fourth floor and took pictures. And then I went back in my office and plugged them into the computer and then let it create the model for me. So you can do this with your cell phone. You don't need any kind of special camera. And the software is all free. It's on, online. And then this last one of this little plant. So I was only able to, to scan on three sides of the plant. So there's a little bit of a shadow behind it. But I think you guys get the point. That we can, you can make these 3D models with or without lasers just relying on a little bit of technology and computing power. So the drone part. Um, unmanned aerial vehicles are, are becoming more common. How many of you guys have drones? A couple of you? So um, there's some new laws that are changing right now, but what we can do with these drones, and I brought my drone uh, right there, it's a Firefly, and it's, it's got a wing on it so that I can take off hovering with it, and I can transition into forward flight. And by doing that, I save a lot of battery power and I can keep that drone in the air for about 45 minutes. And while it's flying, I have a little mount on the bottom to put my camera in, so it can take hundreds of pictures for me and map an area, so I can go back to my computer in the lab and make a 3D model. Um, and so there's just a few other examples. This is an EB, and it's, it does the same sort of thing. And then this is Humphrey, and it's kind of hard to see him, but I got a video of him in a second. Um, and so we can, we can do things like map environments. We can look at the health of crops if we're looking for a farm. Um, and so at this point, we're stuck with all this technology, and we haven't asked any cool science questions. So we think about how things function in space. So um, traditional things like elevation and slope and aspect. We can look at geophysical things like weathering or like erosion. Uh, temporal things like the seasonality of when flowers come out. It's spring right now, so leaves are starting to grow on the trees. Um, and then other things like species richness and even uh, net ecosystem productivity if we can measure things over time. And so I work for a group called the Critical Zone Observatory. And there are these folks that are hydrologists, geologists, ecologists, geomorphologists, and all these different science people that are interested in all these different things. So there's some folks that are only interested in snow. Other people are interested in water and in water chemistry. Some people are interested in soil. Other people like me are interested in the, the vegetation. And so traditionally, we can go out and we can put our sensors on the trees or our eddy covariance flux towers to smell the atmosphere or our lysimeters or our satellites, and we can measure all these things. But until we get together and we come up with a cool question, we have to, to really find the, the best way to use this new technology that we have available to us to answer something that we couldn't answer before. So, I talked about video games at the beginning and that was really just a hook to get you guys to come watch my talk. But, um, to do a lot of this photo processing, I need a really fast computer. And it just so happens that the same technology they use for video games works really well for stitching together these photographs. So I, I built my new computer recently, and I bought a really big 4K television to use as my monitor. Um, but it, this thing is, is powerful enough that it can stitch together all the photos I'm taking with just a little, little digital camera or do things like working with the LiDAR data that I've got. Um, but for other questions, even this computer is not strong enough. So I've got 128 gigs of RAM, two Xeon cores. How much um, of your computing is actually done in the graphics processor versus the... If I want it to be done faster, I put it through the graphics processor. I can do it through the CPU, but it, because the GPU has thousands of cores, it just takes longer. 
So I can I can split it one way or the other. The GPU only has six gigabytes of RAM, so if I have more than that, then I need to go back to the CPU, and then I'm stuck waiting for a little while. Um, and so this is just a quick example of, of the LiDAR data that I'm using and where I kind of run out of space. So this is an individual tree from the side, and this is what it looks like from above. And this one tree has over 4,000 points that the aircraft saw when it flew over it. And when you zoom out to a 100 by 100 meter area, you're starting to see more like a forest structure, but very quickly you're all the way up to about 18 million points. So that one tile is probably about 100 megabytes. And in that one data set, I have 300 tiles. And so I can't load all these things at one time. So I run out of RAM if I try to put it all on my computer at once. And so at that point, I can go to places like Exceed. So this is the extreme science and engineering portable that uh, NSF has funded. And so all the different supercomputers are on here. And one of the new ones, Comet, is basically built the exact same way as my workstation except there are 4,000 of these paired together. So I can go onto Comet and I can load up the same run that I was trying to do on my one node, which I have in my office, and I can do that across the entire grid if I, if I sit long enough in the queue and it's finally my turn. There are other scientists that are doing research on there as well. Okay, can we hit go here? So this is some work we did last fall with um, some of the drones. And this is out in Walnut Gulch, which is near Tombstone. And this is the EB, and it has a multi-spectral camera in it. And so you shake it, and it turns on. And once it's, it's up to full blast, and you don't chop your shirt up, you can throw it in the air. And so they've pre-programmed it with a, a flight area. So it goes out, and it, it flies around. And right now, I'm doing terrestrial scans at those targets right there. I've got the, the terrestrial laser set up. And so the EB is flying along like a little turkey vulture. And it, you can kind of hear it buzzing like a swarm of bees. And it comes back a little while later. And then you can download the data from it. OK, here's Humphrey. So this octocopter has a hyperspectral camera, so 100 something bands. And it also has a, a LiDAR unit on it that's spinning right there. And so um, this thing is very expensive. And when it flies, you're very scared that something is going to go wrong. But um, we were able to collect some good data that day. And one of our limitations is actually just battery power. So we had, I think, eight battery packs, and we burned all of them in about an hour. So we had a generator trying to recharge our batteries so we could do more scans while we were out there. Um, so our octocopter goes up and it does all that cool stuff. And it comes back in one piece. And everyone relaxes a little bit. And so in this area, you can see basically we're just flying over grassland. And this particular grassland, that's all an invasive African grass, which took over that site about 10 years ago. So we take that data. And so I've got the terrestrial laser scan data that I took. And we did nine scan points around this little watershed. And we can take the data from the octocopter. And this is, the, this is one band of the hyperspectral that, that we've segmented out so you can see the different kinds of plants that are in this other site. And so when I, I look at the terrestrial LiDAR data, so that's one scan point right there, and there's another scan point, and then this little box that I've sliced out is this area in here. And so what you can see is the laser was able to penetrate through the grass. It hits the top of the grass, and it gets most of the way to the ground, but in sites like right here, it doesn't make it through. And that's just a line of sight problem. There's too much grass. You can't see through the grass. So despite having this really cool instrument, I can't find the ground. And so that part of the reason we were out there using the drone was we can fly over in the octocopter. And so again, you can see those yellow points up there, but it also goes all the way through the ground. So you can use the octocopter to, to penetrate down to ground level, and it measures the heights of the grass, and it's giving you all those cool 100 and something bands of spectral information. So here's our, our wonderful Earth, and we think about. Um, Can you go back just a second? Yeah. What's the so what in doing that type of scanning? Is it a way to manage getting rid of that grass, reintroducing native species? Um, it's going to be to first. So we'll, the first question is, what, what do we see when we go out with these instruments, and can they do it? 
And the, the EB data, which I didn't show yet, um, it, it does the structure for motion. So we get the, the 3D model from the imagery. And so the, the idea is that we can use a good surface model that we can get from aerial LIDAR. And we can use the structure for motion or the octocopter LIDAR to monitor things like production. So this is a flux tower site. So they're measuring the amount of CO2 that gets pulled out of the air in the footprint of the flux tower. And at the same time, there's cattle that are grazing in here, and there's grasshoppers, and there's other things. And so we can go out with the drone, and we can fly every day. Whereas with a traditional orthophoto or even a manned aerial LIDAR flight, you can only get that done once. So we're trying to monitor productivity over time. Um, with the, the hyperspectral camera, we could do things like a species identification. Um, but at this point, the management implications are a little bit further down the road. But um, production and utilization is one aspect that we'll be going after immediately. But first, we have to show that this stuff works, that we, you can measure this. So we have our, our planet. And I've mentioned the critical zone a little bit, but I just want to define it for you. So it's this heterogeneous environment near the surface that makes up everything between solid rock and the top of the trees. So you include the atmosphere in there. And it's just this thin little band. And so for some of my research, I'm very interested in how energy affects the critical zone. So we have energy from the sun coming down and striking the surface. Most of that's re-radiated as heat back into space. A lot of it, or some of the energy is also just reflected either off of particulates or off of clouds or even off the surface. And then there's more energy that can come and leave in what they call latent energy. So if you have um, a droplet of water that's warm, that has energy in it. And if it showed up from somewhere else and it brought that energy to the site. <clears throat> and so when we, we think about how energy enters the critical zone, it does things like geochemical reactions, so like weathering of soils. Um, or in some cases you have things like geothermal heat, so maybe if you're in Yellowstone or some place where there's magma near the surface, that can be doing some of the, the work. Um, but the, the part that I'm most interested in is that tiny fraction of light that plants take in and then they convert into biomass through one of the most important chemical reactions on our planet, which is photosynthesis. And so, we, we've understood photosynthesis for a long time. This is a pretty old painting, and it shows the tree taking carbon dioxide and turning it into biomass, and we can eat that, and we can respire that, or we can take that and put it into one of our, our energy generators and burn it. And so that, that simple equation where you take carbon dioxide and water, and you put in a little bit of energy and you make a carbohydrate, can be reversed and go the opposite way, and then you have that sugar that you eat, and then you respire it, and you breathe out the CO2, and you have water. So thinking about how that energy comes into the critical zone and is then used up by different things. So we've got all these different measurements we're making now with satellites, with planes, with drones, with flux towers. Now, how can I use this computing power to really boil down into this stuff? So this is another shot of LIDAR. So this is the aerial LIDAR. And this is a site um, in central Arizona with some juniper and some ponderosa pine. And just to point out, the, the trees that are darker, that are black, those are dead. So they've lost their leaves. So the LIDAR is shooting in the infrared so it can, it can bounce off of the needles or the branches and it picks up on whether or not those things have foliage or not. So I can see tens of thousands of trees in, in this one LIDAR tile. And so I have to find a way to segment these things out and then measure how much biomass they have or how much leaf area they have or how fast they're doing uh, different processes. And so when we couple back in that, that idea about the sun coming down and beating down on the surface, it has a differential effect if you're on the south side of a mountain or on the north side which, when you're in the northern hemisphere. Um, that water that comes in is either evaporated or it's absorbed into the surface. And so that, there's a, a big change there with both aspect and also with position. So if you grow lower on a slope, then you're probably receiving more water that fell somewhere else and has either arrived over the surface or through the subsurface. 
and so this is going to be hard to see because I can't zoom in on it, but um, I can take the lie down to my canopy height model, and we're not going to be able to see the individual trees, but trust me, there's little trees there, and I can use what they call allometric equations to quantify how much biomass is in each one of those trees. And then I can turn that into something like a grid pixel because it's kind of hard to work with point scale measurements when you're looking at, at things like topography. And so I can, I can measure how much biomass is on every 10 by 10 meter pixel on that landscape. And so when I do that over an entire watershed, what I see is that north aspects have more biomass than south aspects and that lower topographic positions in your stream bottoms have far more biomass than do ridges. And so this biomass is non-linearly distributed because of probably the way the water is moving, but also because of the way that the sun is striking the surface. So this is a site in southern Arizona. And um, if you can right click, you can loop this so we can keep watching it. But um, this is an area on the back side of the Santa Ritas that has oak on it. And so you can see that we're moving towards the summer right now and everything brightens up, that's high summer. And then as we move back towards winter, it starts to get darker in the north aspects. And so what this animation is showing us is the total amount of energy that that landscape is receiving. And so we can see that south aspects are more exposed and have less trees. We can see that north aspects generally have more trees, but they also receive less energy. So we can also think about this in urban areas. So a lot of us are interested in how um, we're going to power our homes in the future, or how to keep our houses insulated. And so we can use solar radiation models like this to, to look at first where to put our panels. Should we put them on our roof? Should we put them in our yard? Maybe you're interested in where to put your garden. I know that the county is interested in where to put um, new trees along their bike loop or along their pedestrian paths so people can have shade when they're walking. And so this is just an aerial photo of the university. And we'll go ahead and start this one. So this is the same solar radiation model run for a full year. Um, and I will say that to do this, one tile on my computer takes about um, 30 minutes for one day. And so to do an entire year, I sent this off to Exceed over the internet, and they processed it for me in about two hours. So they, they give me 400 cores, and then it just processes every day at the same time. And then it all comes back when it's done. So it's a, an easy way to distribute that information out, and then it comes back that I wouldn't be able to do on my own. And I went really fast, and I'm done already. But um, just want to thank my, my funding sources, the CZO, NSF, the Agricultural Research Service, Department of Energy, and the School of Natural Resources. And thanks for showing up. And we have a lot of time for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Now is the right time to call on the experts. You, you can identify yep. people. Pat on the right and then pat on the left. Oh, hi. Um, interestingly, I haven't really thought about uh, using drones like this, but could you use could you do stuff with real time with a laptop? And I'm thinking in terms of rescue of people yeah. out in the wild or you know, locating a bear that attacked somebody or a mountain lion. Um, but I'd really like to use it. I'm a fly fisherman. <laughs> and uh, you gotta find the holes, you know. And uh, it'd be interesting to have something that would also, like a meter that could show depth of water too. Yeah. 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 Um, Has anybody ever done that stuff? Yeah. So the real time stuff the drones can do. Um, this little antenna right here. Um, you can get another one on there that will stream to a live video back to your heads up display. And so you can have a laptop or you can have goggles. Um, and you just put a camera on there and it'll stream that, that image straight back. <coughs> Um, so they are using them for search and rescue. Um, this, this is a newer drone that's only been out for about a year and a half now. Um, but I expect to see more of these because the, the octocopters, they're really limited with their battery life. They can only stay in the air for about 10 to 15 minutes. Whereas the ED is in the air for about a half hour. Um, this one, if I load it up with batteries, and I haven't tried it with double bat four batteries and the camera on board, they can stay in there for an hour with just batteries. So the, the battery life will get better as the technology improves. Um, but 
But to, to do mapping, uh, particularly the stream depth, you, you'd need like LiDAR, a green laser to penetrate through the water. Um, and that would be very expensive. But you can do it, for sure. I heard something about research done on the canopy. I think this was in Europe. And they were talking about the type of trees that were planted after clear cutting or after forestry operations. Something about darker leaves versus lighter leaves or CO2 update. Yeah, yeah. So, so leaves are different. So there's some leaves in the shade rate. Um, and so the, the leaves that, that grow in the sun the, their photosynthesis, they actually can suffer a little bit, they call it photorespiration. So if they get too hot, the, their molecules get kind of um, plastic and sloppy. And, and instead of binding carbon dioxide, so it's, it's a waste of the reaction process. So, you must have it. so um, they do different things where some, some trees will just put out some leaves that do very little to photosynthesis. And then that's the shade of the um, For my research, when we do uh, tree modeling and leaf modeling, it's called the big leaf model. So you simplify the whole tree in one leaf. And they, they have the big leaf with the sun and the shade of the leaf. Can this technology be used for subsurface um, excavation if you, want, if you want to go 50 feet below? Um, for ground penetrating stuff, there's, there's some technology out there. So there's what they call. Um, in in SAR or in far it's it's I remember the, the, the name right, but it's it's two radar devices on two sides of the wing, and it's 3D radar, and that will penetrate down a few feet. And the best example I've seen is in dry sand. So if you're over like a sand dune, you can find lost pyramids and stuff. Um, but to to actually penetrate down deep into the into the surface, you need to actually be on the surface. And there is another technology called ground penetrating uh, radar. And so they, they usually put those things on like, a little dolly and we'll drag them around. And that can penetrate them quite deep. And so some of the folks I work with use that technology to, to find where um, the soil turns into what they call saprolite rock, which is like the fractured stuff. And it goes all the way down to the crystalline bedrock. And so the speed of that pulse going down gets faster as it hits more solid material. So it's possible that they can come up with something in the future that, that does penetrate that deep. But it, the closest, I think, is this um, interferometric radar, which can, can go down a few feet, but 50 feet might be too deep. I think they also have acoustic uh, ways of doing that. The oil companies set up charges. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the charges, yeah. So the, the ground penetrating radar works the same way, but it's it's just at a higher frequency and they can move around and get profiles and stuff. So. Um, I think one of your slides was talking about modeling forest composition. Mm -hmm. And does the, is the technology such that you're able to look at forest pests and those types of... Yeah, yeah, so you can. So the, the thing that I'm excited about with the drone is that we can get this temporal repeat interval higher. So um, the, the multispectral, hyperspectral stuff will pick up on the health of the trees. If you do it enough, you have to grandfather it. Um, but to pick up on things like pests, you have to be there at the right time to catch it. And so the thing like the drone, that if you know, we think something's going on, I can run up there in the truck that day and collect some data. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely it's possible to be done and it's being done at some scale now. Yeah. Um, so just to follow up to that, so uh, what what is the time horizon for being able to look at sort of uh, being able to have a story of um, how pests and climate are changing the composition of the forest? Um, I think there's a lot of research that's already that's being done on that now, and so the scale that they're doing that at, um, they use satellite to to look at some of the, the major insects. Uh, pest outbreaks that take place at mountain pine beetles, um, Pacific Northwest, um, and there's other things like spruce beetle and hips that, that are hitting out. And those those projects, they when, when you do things in space, you're limited to the size of the sensor. So 
your pixels are going to be the size of a baseball bat. Whereas when you go out with the terrestrial lighting, you can resolve individual leaves. So you're always playing with this problem of having to scale when you move from that speed spot. So what's your prediction about when this technology might be affordable enough for land management agencies to be able to begin to use them in their resource management uh, missions? It's almost there. So this, this drone costs $2,000, which is less than uh, the DJI thing you create. So it's, it's almost there, but it's going to take a lot of hard work to kind of get it tuned up and get people familiarize with it. So it's, I think maybe three years, five years, you would see people doing it. The, the feds have just changed the laws on, on drones um, significantly in the last year. So they're trying to open it up, but then still keep it in line. Thank you. I'm interested in your, your funding problems. Yeah, obviously, in height budgetary. <coughs> you have a number of sources, it looks like, for funding. How much time do you spend on you know, applications and yeah. how hard is it? Is it getting harder, easier? It's, it's very hard. Easier. So the, I think the success rate for NSF proposals is 7%, 5%. So um, the projects that I should, this is three or four years of work. So some of like the, the slides on the forest stuff is work that I did last year. And then the stuff with the drone and stuff we're doing this year. Um, so the from the funding perspective, it's very very competitive, um, and finding finding the resource early. So the, my my project with ARS, they actually came to me with this question, and I said I can do that. And I didn't tell them I'd never built a drone before, but you know it's there, there's people out there that have questions that are local that you can you can find versus going through a national competition, which is very tough. But when you get it, it's pretty sweet. How much time do you spend? I spend probably, I spend less because I'm, I was, I just finished my postdoc. So I, I graduated and then I just took projects. So these, these were projects that were already funded. Um, but I probably spend 15% of my time thinking about money, looking for money. I know that other professors probably spend more. Can you mention something about the bark beetle and mm -hmm. how that's affecting the forest here in Arizona and probably California? Yeah. Sort of yeah. Um, do you hear any discussion amongst some of the, the other uh, collaborators that you work with about uh, the technique called gene drive, which is to genetically alter uh, insects' uh -huh. genome? that will then get passed on to successive generations. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the, yeah I haven't, the, the dangers associated with that. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard about anyone discussing um, going after the insects. Um, I think that would, would probably run into a lot of, of headwind. Um, but I've been talking about it for mosquitoes. And yeah, mosquitoes, mosquitoes I hear a lot. But um, what, what I do see is going on, they have things called common gardens. Um, and so these people will go out and they'll plant a bunch of different genotypes of the species. And then they'll watch it over time. And so um, things like pinion pine, which were particularly hard hit by the 2000s drought, um, some of those uh, genotypes actually did pretty well. And so some of these, the, within a species, you have this plasticity so that some, some of these are drought colonies, but they may not be insect colonies. So the same ones that were drought tolerant were also more likely to be damaged by insects at other times. So there's the, the common garden idea is that you find the hardiest uh, stock and then you breed those and then you go out and do those planting. So if we have large stocks or we lose the entire forest, you would have some kind of trees that you go out and plant. But to be honest, there's not enough money in that. So we have no no dedication to saving the forest after we've lost it. And we're, the Forest Service, I think, spent the majority of the budget last year on the fires. So that's just going to get worse. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sweatman tonight. It is due to his generosity of his time and his ideas and information that our uh, science night will thrive and be a success and valuable for us. So thank you very much.
Oh. Welcome, everybody. It's really awesome to see you here this evening. My name is Bonnie Miller, and I teach middle school science. And I'm going to introduce one of my students who's a sixth grader, who, among other sixth graders, has an awesome project over in the science area. Her name is um, Madison Holland, and she's going to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Dr. Armstrong is a professor of surgery at the University of Arizona and deputy director at the Arizona Center for Accelerated Biomedical Innovation. Dr. Armstrong holds a Master's of Science in Tissue Repair and Wound Healing from the University of Wales College of Medicine and a PhD from the University of Manchester College of Medicine, where he was appointed visiting professor of medicine. He also co-founded the Southern Arizona Lung Salvage Alliance. Armstrong was appointed Deputy Director of the Arizona Center for Accelerated Biomedical Innovation and co-founder of its Augmented Human Initiative, which places him at the nexus of the merger of consumer electronics, wearables, and medical devices. Dr. Armstrong also has two daughters that currently attend the Gregory School. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Armstrong to the Gregory School. That was, very, that was very kind of you. Well, there's like another portal. That was like magical. That was very, very kind. Ladies and gentlemen, Madison. Well, actually, yeah, I've had three daughters uh, uh, to come through, and this seems like like the ultimate uh, expression of like uh, like take your father, your dad to like a work day. Or what does your dad do for at work? This is this is terrific, uh, and and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and, uh, uh, and and share some of this with you. And uh, since we have a cozy group, you guys are very welcome to ask any questions that you like. We're going to try to cover a lot of ground in a very very short period of time before Peck comes up. And I saw a slide that uh, that he was uh, uh, showing, and it's uh, um, I think he's probably going to talk about uh, the College of Science lecture series that we have. And I don't know if any of you have been have any of you been to that lecture series. Some of you have, well, and if you have, you're probably uh, you're probably evangelical about it. It's one of these gems in the community. It's, uh, it's kind of like a sporting event for science. It's, it's extraordinary. And, I, and if you haven't been, I would just, I'd urge you to go every, it's actually, we're right in the middle of it right now. We're talking about, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's about climate change. Uh, and you're going to hear from Peck about it, but it's, it's exceptional. Once a week, every Monday. Uh, and uh, every year, it's something different. And I've, I've been on that uh, planning committee forever. Uh, and it really is warm. But what we're going to try to talk about in our brief time together as the warm-up act for his truly um, is to really try to cover a lot of ground. We're going to, we're going to try to uh, talk about uh, a lot of the work that uh, uh, we did do at, uh, at uh, College of Medicine and also at uh, the University of Arizona uh, uh, in total, but a lot of other efforts that are going around. But uh, in, in a lot of ways, what we're really going to be talking about uh, is demography. And I'm not going to start with... Uh, uh, any uh, histogram or any data or scatter plot or anything. Uh, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to start with a year. And uh, this is just a few years ago um, and when some of my daughters were actually in middle school. Um, and, you know, uh, probably most of us weren't thinking about this. We were in the midst of this economic funk, but this was probably the most important year demographically in any of our lives. And uh, why, why do I say that? Well, this was the first year in the history of us that more folks died from, from non-infectious diseases than from all the plagues uh, in the world combined. Pick your plague. Um, and that's a big deal. And the big, the, the big non-infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases are heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and also if you want to add in a fourth, uh, lung disease as well. So that's a, that's a really big deal. And when things like this happen, it, uh, you have to start thinking about not just medicine, not just demography, but policies and families, and this is going to affect all of us. And maybe it should start making us look at the world a little differently. And uh, I'll share with you a good friend of mine, uh, Steve Jones, who sits on the UK uh, Stem Cell Foundation, and he's kind of a science pundit now uh, in, uh, in the UK. And he talked not about the three ways that we've lived throughout the eons, but really the three ways that we've died. And it's kind of macabre, really, kind of British, really. Well, he's a Welshman, forgive me. Yeah, that was, forgive me, 
Uh, but, uh, but there you have it. All the more reason to talk about the three inches of gas if he's Welsh. Uh, but the first way we used to die was this way. It was, uh, was by disaster. We'd uh, get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or a fall off a precipice. Uh, there were probably sharp things involved. Uh, this is how we died. Probably 95% of our existence as a species was like this. And I, I was not a history major, uh, and I didn't know that we coexisted with that. Uh, but, but you know, I got this from a very good source. So, uh, but, 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 but the bottom line is that this happened to us for 95% of our existence, but, but uh, when we got small and climbed out of the canoe, we, uh, we circled the wagons. Uh, literally, literally, figuratively, and we moved into kind of agrarian societies maybe 10, 12,000 years ago, and we stopped being uh, dying necessarily from disaster like you see here from uh, Jurassic Park, and we, start, we started dying from what? When we were close together from, from, from disease. So as I said, you know, pick uh, your uh, plague, uh, Persinia pestis, uh, Vibrio cholera, uh, now you're hearing about dengue fever and chikungunya and all these terrible hemorrhagic fevers and all these vowels, it's hard to remember all these dang things, but it's, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's been scary for quite a long time. But over the last uh, uh, decade, uh, a switch has been flipped, and, and while it may figure away a little bit in the arc of time, it's unlikely that over the broad stroke that we're going to go back uh, to predominantly that uh, uh, from this, although you're going to hear a lot, I think, from Peck about this that might suggest otherwise in certain cases in the short term. In the short term. But then, this is the way we die. Not from disaster, not from disease, but from decay. Uh, and, and so it's slow, insidious, and so what we're going to be talking about, and what we have to plan for uh, in the long term, demographically, as a society for not only for us and our parents, but our grandparents and our kids, is really replacement parts in a lot of ways. And it's, uh, it's, it's really quite extraordinary, and I think it's a new way to really be thinking about a lot of this. And I think I would just uh, uh, ask you to do this. But if we're going to be trying to fight this problem, and, uh, and uh, then I think we have maybe some strategies if we're dealing with it. We can either uh, just acquiesce, just say, OK, to DK. That's pretty reasonable. You know, it's the natural order of things. It's like entropy. Things fall apart. And just, just acquiesce. I, you know, that's comforting. I could probably do that. The other possibility, uh, another one might be to, uh, yeah, to this, to, uh, to disobey uh, DK. And this is, uh, in addition to rhyming and being alliterative, you know, it's kind of, uh, it seems kind of naughty, uh, maybe a little bit uh, hubristic, like you're playing God. Let's not go there, but it's a possibility um, if you're really uh, hubristic. But maybe we can triangulate, since we're in the middle of a political season, and uh, maybe we can delay DK just a little bit. And, and, uh, and I think maybe this has a little bit more potential uh, as a strategy. So let's just do this. It's just for the rest of our next 10, 15 minutes together. How are we doing? We're good. Let's, let's talk about this and, and where things are going from the most simple things that you think are simple that are in your pocket to the really pretty friggin' awesome things, some of which we're working on, others, other uh, friends of ours are working on, and other parts of the world, uh, and, we're, and, and where things are moving. So let's tour Tomorrowland today. We're going to... It kind of all rhymes. You almost make like a Dr. Seuss thing out of it. So, what's our? If we're going to tour Tomorrowland today, I think we got to visit maybe uh, not just the regular app store, maybe the human app store. Uh, but first, let's talk about uh, this is a, this is an old screenshot of maybe four generations ago of a, of a, of a cell phone already of, a, of my iPhone. I'm not one that stands in line, uh, but I get them pretty early, and uh, I'm kind of a hyper early adopter of these things. But, if you, but there are so many. It used to be so exotic uh, when we first started talking about health apps. Now there are so many uh, out there that exist that really span the body. And, uh, and if we look at it, I mean, they go all the way from uh, things that uh, uh, will help you sleep to things that uh, monitor your heart. We now have super cool bio patches. I didn't bring it because I didn't think this was going to be kind of a show and tell thing. But we have all these different things you can patch on that hook up to your cell phone that give us tremendous amounts of information about what we're doing and how we're moving through the world. But if we really think about all these different kinds of devices, they really fit into two different areas. Uh, broad. I mean, the first uh, category would be things like this, would be like kind of an alarm system uh, that would tell you if there's something wrong, like that alive core. 
heart app that might tell you, well, if your heart's stopping, not that you need to know, you know, that your heart's stopping. It strike me that you probably would have some forewarning, like maybe your, if your heart's stopping, like your, uh, you'd have chest pain or something. But uh, the bottom line is an alarm bell for a problem that's about to start. But then the other possibility is rather than being an alarm bell, it would be like this, like a Prius, um, and uh, just what you'd be thinking, right? Uh, it just like a Prius kind of uh, coaxes us into better uh, economy. Uh, so too might some of these gadgets and some of these apps uh, coax us into better sort of health economy, if you will, maybe coaxing us into better uh, behavior. Uh, and uh, so, if we're if we're uh, thinking about a Prius, uh, and if we're thinking about alarm bells, and we're thinking about health apps, uh, then naturally um, we would uh, uh, think about uh, uh, Hobbes, naturally. And, uh, and, and so most of you are pretty familiar with the social contract theorists, I'm sure, in the moon. And, uh, you know, and Hobbes, uh, you know, was uh, quite famous uh, for, for saying that life can be uh, nasty, brutish, and short. And in exchange for a little bit longer life, uh, maybe we would uh, form a social contract uh, so that perhaps uh, we can live in a little bit more security. So what we would suggest, maybe, is uh, so our lives won't be nasty, brutish, and long, uh, maybe we... Uh, have to get into a little bit better health security. And this is a really uh, significant area now where who owns our data uh, and where are these data leading to us. It's beyond the can, beyond the discussion of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, but it is something that we have to think about uh, very, very hard. But in order to have a strategy to delay decay, uh, to move forward in this area, um, I think what we really need to do is, is this. We need to get smart. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about a few of these uh, 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 different kinds of technologies. And the first thing we'll talk about, of course, is a smart shirt, naturally. Uh, so uh, th th this technology uh, is one that we've worked on for many, many years with many other colleagues. Georgia Tech uh, started some of this stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, this technology can monitor almost anything, but, but first and foremost, heart rate uh, and, uh, uh, and sweat. What we also have are really cool pendants now. Uh, that used, This used to be so exotic, but now we have devices that look. They can tell us if we're running, walking, jumping, crawling, begging for mercy, uh, and uh, any of these sorts of things that we're doing. But if you look at a lot of the activity that we see now with uh, these intelligent textiles and intelligent pendants, what we also see is it looks a lot like kind of an EKG for your life. And we're starting to see some really fascinating patterns. Uh, not only things that could presage a heart attack, like a regular, regular pattern, but what we're also seeing uh, now as we look at these intelligent textiles, intelligent pendants, uh, and, and other sorts of things for our parents uh, are things that can maybe predict uh, if there's going to be a problem in the very, very near future. Uh, this is a good example from, uh, from our team as well. We have what really can be boiled down mathematically into almost a barcode for someone's activity, and we can identify frail and non-frail folks, but then we can identify little signatures of activity that can predict if someone's going to fall. Not now, uh, it's not I fall and I can't get up, but it's Mrs. Jones, you're about to fall and you're about not to get up and we're calling you now and maybe we can give you little exercises that can improve your stability so that you can stay at home instead of, uh, in, uh, instead of in the nursing home. It's a big fear, not, not only that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we have about our parents, but certainly that our parents have. What are all of our parents worried about? Worried about falling, at home, hurting themselves, uh, and then uh, forever being uh, uh, in, uh, losing their independence. So this is this is terrific. This is happening right now. In addition, we have all these other really cool gadgets. This is these are examples. Yeah, I'm a foot doctor, so uh, I, I have to focus on feet. We have really cool smart socks, and these devices can actually. Uh, I, I was just wearing some earlier. We were testing some new ones that can actually identify uh, the not only pressure and temperature on the bottom of the foot, but it can also. Um, it can, it can identify when a joint is moving uh, out of alignment and when it's uh, and when and when one's actually changing uh, uh, one's gait patterns and when one can actually predict uh, arthritis potentially even before it happens and maybe even change gait. But for what I do, which is uh, in trying to prevent wounds and, and amputations on the bottom of the foot, we now have devices like this that are real, uh, really terrific. They're security systems uh, for the body because we can identify hot spots uh, before they ever happen. These devices now have been. Uh, moved not only into socks, but also into insoles, and now into something like this, which is just a really uh, cool little bath mat that looks like something you can get a bed bath and beyond or, or wherever, 
So this is something that you can stand on and can identify a problem in someone with diabetes, say, who has lost the gift of pain, uh, and, but, but where we can identify a hot spot that might become a wound way before it ever happens. And now we're seeing this, where we can identify these things not hours before they happen, or after they've happened, but up to 40 days before they've happened. And we predict that many of these sorts of tools are not going to be paid for by an insurance company or any of these sorts of things. We think that a lot of these things are probably going to be like what we're already doing, kind of smart subscriptions, just like we pay for our Hulu or our Netflix or our cell phone bill. I think a lot of these things are going to be value-added kind of, kind of ideas. And it's, a, it's kind of an exciting time. This technology was developed between our team at Salsa at the U of A and uh, at the uh, MIT Business School and Harvard Business School. So uh, it's really it's pretty cool and it's a lot of fun and it's a, I think a signal of things to come in this sort of smart home where we might have smart subscriptions to smart appliances and the line between an appliance and like a health appliance is kind of getting blurred. How does but, a hot yeah. spot presage a, a wound or an ulcer? Great question. So, so for instance, um, it, a wound will heat up before it breaks down. So, if uh, um, so, someone with diabetes loses what one of my mentors used to call the, the gift of pain. So, uh, and so they develop neuropathy. So they can't feel something. I was just operating this morning on someone who had walked on a nail for six days uh, and uh, didn't uh, didn't know it until he was uh, kind of you know heard that from the on the linoleum. So. This uh, kind of thing, those kinds of things, can actually identify um, uh, that problem and also act kind of like a sensory substitute. Uh, and if you want to sound smart, you're talking about any chronic disease, just mutter inflammation in your breath and then walk away and you'll be right, pretty much. And you'll, you'll look intelligent, brooding, and probably, you know, let's say, troubled genes. Uh, but not that I, you have to do that, because clearly it was an insightful question. But, uh, but that's really, that, that's what we see with, for instance, with diabetes and that one specific device. Um, and, uh, and it really is terrific. Well, may I ask, what's next? Uh, and I think really what's moving next is moving away from just that, that, uh, just that phone really into sort of cybernetic devices. And I mean, we don't think of bifocals or a, a, a hearing aid as cybernetic, but it, it, they, they, kind of, they, they, kind of, they kind of are, they are meant our reality, they augment our life. And these things are daily good now, really, but they're, they're, they weren't at uh, one point when they came out. Uh, and uh, now, there are so many uh, ways forward. Naturally, the next thing you think about is wearable robots, right? Um, I was just at the first wearable robot symposium uh, last week. Um, it's quite extraordinary because I got this car. This, uh, that, that, that I, I have a, and it has autopilot on it and it drives for me. And so I was driving a freaking robot car to a robot meeting. So it was just, God, I looked over and I was, and I was thinking about my daughters. Ms. Miller, I was thinking about my daughters and I thought, you know, they're, they're gonna be, their, their daughters are unlikely to even have a driver's license. Uh, and they're gonna talk about the day, you know, we're gonna talk, it's gonna be like, when we talk about cars, we talk, we're talking about a covered wagon. Uh, anyway, I'm going off the, uh, the reservation. Naturally, wearable robots. Uh, uh, so so yeah, this seems ridiculous and exotic, but it's, but it's really not. It's, there's, there's so much going on right now. Uh, there are all these really cool testosterone-inducing names like Hal and, and, uh, and Viper and all these other su super uh, uh, just uh, 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 infused names. But this, is, this device right now is, uh, is uh, the hybrid assisted limb, which we play around with, is now in widespread use in uh, uh, facilities in, in Japan, where there are already inverted in their demographics. They don't have a lot of kids to take care of their parents. Um, and this thing is super cool. It just, it has like a little device that actually um, identifies the intention to move and then amplifies it. Like a, like a mic would amplify my voice. This just amplifies uh, the intention to move. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, this is actually a, a Professor Seiko, who's the uh, uh, inventor of the device, he's a terrific fellow. And now they have all of these new devices that are helping us hump our larger paths and move through the world a little bit more intelligently. So there are either going to be things that help us move through the world, help us carry more things, or help us move if we've, we haven't been moving in a while. But this, these things are for sale now. And they're getting smaller and cooler. This is a device that Honda sells. You know, they sell where they sell cars and snowblowers and now wearable robots. 
Uh, and uh, this device is uh, just in order, uh, designed to help someone at home that's a little older get around and, uh, and, and, and hopefully function independent. So this uh, walk assist device now is in widespread use and widespread testing. Other devices uh, that we've been testing that are uh, internal, I just, we don't have time to talk about this, but uh, perhaps in the future we can talk about all of the new internal devices, uh, because this is a soft robot. This is a, this is a conduit app uh, that is a vascular conduit made out of PTFE cortex, which is what we use to do vascular bypasses, and it's literally now paired, like you pair a phone on the back table on the operating room, and then now this device can be used to do a bypass on a patient, but now instead of coming in for regular tests, you can actually get checked in your home with your, just through Wi-Fi. It's quite, it's really extraordinary. And this is uh, in, uh, in, in early stage testing and uh, it's by a, a company and some friends of ours that we called GraphWorks. So stay tuned, stay tuned for this thing. Are they paying attention to the security implications? It's a really great question. And in fact, we started uh, with Homeland Security and uh, DARPA and a couple other groups, the very first protection profile um, for implantable medical devices. We started with diabetes because that's an area of interest for to me, but it's also because they're the most implanted devices uh, that already exist for, for artificial pancreases that are getting started now, but also for continuous uh, 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 subcutaneous devices that identify uh, glucose and pumps. But the very first protection profile have been developed that can give people some assurance, but also give industry something to aim for instead of everyone just being scared of someone hacking into a body part and stopping your heart like you might see on some, you know, you know some television show. Because some of the stuff is really actually quite possible. Well, some of it you have to be quite clever, but uh, a lot of it, if you're just really determined, is, uh, is, po is possible now. Anyway, enough of the, uh, of the doom and gloom and scary stuff. And then, although some of this is, uh, all of it is sort of geek-tastic, but it's also borderline. Uh, I mean, we have to ask these sorts of questions now. As many of these devices are on us and in us, which is more of a part of us, we have to ask, what is it really that makes us us? And, and uh, you know, let's start with the thing that kind of, uh, we, we all have, you know, we all have in our pocket, for better or for worse, have our cell phones, right? And these things are basically like a freaking artificial organ. I, I just asked a couple of my fellows this morning, what would you rather give up? A, a redundant organ or your phone? And to a one, they said, ah, freaking kidding. Uh, that's right. And so that's, that, I think it's, it, these things have become just another, you know, another appendage, as it were, or another organ. It's, and, but why do they have to be outside of us? Why can't they be inside of us? And in order to be inside of us, this seems weird, but what you need is you need like a screen, right? You need like an input device. Uh, and then you need a computer with some memory. So we'll tr talk about those things and dissemble them and then bring them back together. So, because these things are happening now. So you already know, like, getting something into a phone. Siri has been around forever. This was the very first Siri. It's like a, it's like a, 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 a it, it seems like it's so, so long ago now. But you look at all these people, they're so happy talking to their phone. <laughs> a bunch of Stepford people you know, running around. It, it, it all works. It just works so great. Like, it really does in real life. Um, but, but look, so, so this is the way people are already communicating with their phones. That's great. So now we have part of an input device, and, and voice tech has gone by leaps and bounds over the last few years. That's, that's great. So we can check that off the list. But what about, uh, what about a screen? So um, we were alpha testers. Uh, one of my close friends growing up uh, was part of this Google X division uh, in Yogi. Uh, so we, got, we were alpha testers for the, those geeky Google glasses, and uh, we were the first to use them in the operating room. But let's get away from those because they're. Uh, let's move on to something that's even cooler, and that's this. This is a this is a, uh, a contact lens now that has a, a, right in the middle. I don't know if you can see this. If you can't hallucinate with me, you see that LED in there. That LED now functions like a 55-inch screen, uh, and and around it, you see that's the antenna, and then then you just have the chip, and it, it charges by inductive charging. It's it's freaking crazy. So now you might be able to wear a contact lens in the very, not too distant future, but you're not going <laughs> to go to lens crafters, right? You, you go to Best Buy and, uh, to, to, to buy your contact lens. I mean, this is getting crazy. Uh, could you imagine, like, in the Super Bowl, like, instead of buying one of those big, their eyes? It's just nuts. So, so there's our screen. Now we can check that out. What's next? Okay, good. Uh, so now we're about memory. So one of the fundamental things that I've seen, and I've, I've been 
teaching residents and students and medical students and undergrads as well for the last, I guess now, quarter century. But what we can see with a lot of them now that is so different than what it used to be is that we, we used to be prized for our ability to recall things quickly. Things that were really completely worthless for a doctor, like the Krebs cycle or these sorts of exotic uh, But in fact, a lot of that isn't very important uh, at the time, but a lot of, a, a, but now, no one even remembers anything. We just ask them a question, and what they do is they just look on their look on their phone and they just Google. So they're all in you know kind of phone position when we when we when we as doctors ask our young students a question. But it's all happening for us now too. If we're around dinner table asking these sorts of questions, but uh, but but now what if now we could record everything that was going on? Uh, this is called life logging, and it's happening now. Uh, several years ago. One of the most popular things to sell uh, that going on at Christmas time was a simple look-see device. This was really exotic a few years ago. Now, of course, we have the GoPros around. They're everywhere. But what if this thing was on constantly? Oh, yeah, good. I have this. So this is just a guy alpha testing this look-see device a few years ago. And he's walking around town looking up there. And he's saying, oh, that's great. That's a nice, nice, like, looking, up, looking around. Oh, 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 there was a lawyer ad on that bus. I forgot what it was. That's OK. No problem. I'll just rewind it. Uh, later and, and get at. So what if this was happening uh, and uh, uh, for us uh, uh, in, in real time we were wearing these sorts of things? Well, there are people that are doing it for a living, but we have to start thinking about how this really affects us uh, as a species, because if we're the sum of our memories, I, that's how we define ourselves. What if we never had, what if our memories were never really summarized? And, and then if we're Instead of like walking down the old story, we'd be walking down memory lane. We walked through the super highway uh, of memory, and, and we were co-evolving with our gadget. And our gadget was co-evolving with us. You know, we stand in line every six months now for a phone. Maybe uh, and, and uh, this device is learning more and more about us, telling us more and more. And it's, these are these are ex these are questions now that are really going to become more and more important as we move on. They're more philosophical uh, than scientific. But what's next? Well, there's this. How about just literally getting inside our own heads and, and mind technology? This is happening. It's happening at our institution and others. And uh, so brain-computer interfaces. Doing a quick EEG or a, a function of certain types of brain imaging, we can ask people to do an action, a motor action. And then we can identify where that action comes from uh, in, in their cortex and then amplify that. We can put a, 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 a something under their skin or just like a little screen cap over them. And then we can bypass, say, a spinal cord and then lead to, uh, uh, and then lead to motion. Check this out. Uh, this leads to things that we would never, ever imagine doing. This woman who's at Brown, who friend, with friends of ours, is for the first time now moving a device with her brain thinking about moving her arm and taking the first sip of water that she hasn't taken um, since she had uh, her injury. And that's, that's just freaking magical. And that's happening now. And uh, there, are, uh, there are now brain-computer interface controlled arms that are entering into FDA uh, clinical trials right now, friends of ours at DECA and others. And this is just extraordinary. So let's close with a couple of quick things. What if now that arm wasn't right in front of that lady? What if it was a hundred kilometers away or a thousand? Uh, and and that's you got to start thinking about what if we made real avatars of ourselves? Imagine uh, imagine if you were uh, the uh, oh, I didn't, oh I guess that video didn't even show that's okay. So I, let me let me explain what this uh, what, the, what the video I was going to show you is that there, there are, one now can actually uh, uh, co-locate uh, with something just through the, using a brain-computer interface. And as long as we have a good quality bandwidth uh, and secure bandwidth, we can actually control things now, not only from what you saw there, just, uh, uh, just from a meter away, but at a, at a significant distance. Imagine now uh, teaching someone uh, a, a, or touching your grandchild with a with, with a haptic control device uh, and, and caressing their face from a thousand miles away, 
Or imagine working in a really dangerous place like Fukushima power plant from Tokyo. Uh, this kind of thing now, uh, with uh, dramatic, with, with steady improvements, uh, is very, very likely. Now, finally, let me just talk to you about this. What if we could now get inside of someone's head? Literally, I'll see if this video works. Yeah, check this out. I don't know if you can see this. You just have to hallucinate with me. But check it out. So this guy's playing a really simple video game, and he has the great computer interface on him. And then now this now and, and now this is connected to some of our buddies, uh, to, uh, some of our buddies in University of Washington's labs. And now this fellow has his back and is down the hallway and now has the brain-computer interface connected to, to, a, 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 to, a, 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 to his finger and is actually just thinking about uh, nothing but the actual transmission of a motor signal has just passed from one fellow through space through a brain-computer interface to another fellow's finger uh, and he played a video game. So this is extraordinary, and this is just really magical stuff, because now imagine teaching, imagine teaching uh, piano lessons to someone a thousand miles away, uh, or something along these lines, and you see how mind-bending a lot of this stuff is getting. And maybe, maybe some of these things are now not just uh, 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 centuries away, but generations away, uh, just less than a generation away. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'll, what I'll conclude with is, uh, uh, just like uh, all of you, uh, when I think of, uh, uh, a lot of this stuff, I think, uh, uh, I, of uh, Blaise Pascal. And, uh, and, and Blaise, in addition to having the coolest name ever, um, and I bet he never got rolled for his lunch money, uh, had a wonderful quote. And, and, and what he talked about, I think, is what we all feel when we talk about all these different areas of science. You're going to hear about the environment now. We've just been talking about advances in, uh, in medicine, but we're also talking about advances in computer engineering and and, uh, uh, and in, in battery powering and energy in all these different areas. And what he said back in the day was that knowledge is like a sphere, and, and the greater its volume, the larger its contact uh, with the unknown. And I really believe that. And I think all these different areas of science now are, are evolving, they're expanding, but they're also getting away from us. And what we really have to do is to try as collectively, uh, not only as a society, but as colleagues in different areas, and, science and medicine and the arts and everything, try to collect them and bring them together uh, to find uh, uh, how this evolves not only with science, but with our own humanity. Uh, and hopefully in that area, life won't be uh, nasty, brutish, and short. It won't be nasty, brutish, and long. Uh, hopefully it'll be uh, uh, high quantity and high quality, because I think that's what we all want, and that's what we all deserve uh, for us, for our kids, uh, and, and for our family. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I, I thank you so much. Um, time wise, I don't have a. Do we, do we have maybe five minutes for questions? About? I don't know if you have that amount of time. Modest, but yeah, well, please. That's, yes, sir. I wonder if you could comment on whether bioethics or the deal with philosophy and morality are keeping up with this technology. Yeah, there, it's not. Um, so, so all of these things, I don't uh, So, I uh, so just at this very early lot of meeting last week. And no one was talking about any of this. Everyone was talking about how awesome all this stuff was. And it is. It's extraordinary. But, but how do we control a lot of these things? And, and, and what does it mean um, when um, you know, we're, we're waking up and we're living inside of one of these you know, like a cybernetic devices or something like that? But I think there's a, a real push. Um, and there's definitely a push of U of A now to try to form something of an initiative where we're trying to, to bring in uh, the, the humanities and some humanity in all of these breathtaking, light speed advances. And what you find are all the really exciting things, but then you also find a lot of quantity uh, as well. And, and of some of what you've already brought up in your excellent questions. So basically, it comes down to we have, just because we can do something, we don't necessarily should do something. Yeah, I don't know if that ever really stops anyone. I, I think yeah, I, I think if we can do something we usually do. I think there's a principle of alignment and synergies that has to fit together to at least parts of mesh in such a way that they ultimately yeah. contribute to quality of life. Boy, 
avoidance of that the case. I, I, I could not agree with you more. It is, it is about that. It is about quality, and it's not about widgets, uh, and it's not about gadgets. Uh, it is about that. And I think if we keep our eye on the prize, we can do that. I think we just have to identify. I think, I don't think that we, we always know even what the prize is, but we can't even articulate it as well as you do. But there you have it. Yeah. And yeah. It's like controlling this like hum ball. Yeah. Like both like, what is the thing that's making your head? So that device, that yeah, that the, the so so that so that device is uh, basically just identifying. It's it's a it is an inexpensive on your home your parents or you spent for it. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Well, it's sort of like the, it's it's like an EEG. It's like it has a, it has a sensor in it that identifies uh, brain activity and then allows you to actually do something like, like move a ball up and down. That's, that, so that's, that's all right. those things are for sale. And there are also some really cool um, uh, devices that can identify the mood and, and, uh, and, and how you're feeling. You can try to manipulate that as well. So these things are all happening. That's, uh, it, it's going to be a long time, by a long time, probably five years, before you'll be able to play a video game like that in real, in really, really fast, because the latency is the big thing. But it's, it's on. So you were a really good adopter, man. Like Neil Armstrong. Okay, I think we're going to end there. And once again, Dr. Armstrong, thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> um, we're going to take just a couple minutes to transition over. But if you wouldn't mind, we have a lot of people who are standing outside waiting to come in. If you are sitting on the the edges. Would you mind getting friendly with the people in the middle and speaking in? Just so this way we don't have people trying to climb over the Thank you. Had the chance to go check them out. They were really fantastic. Um, our breakout session speakers, 
did a phenomenal job and was really fascinating. And um, I just wanted you to thank you to the board members who are here tonight. Uh, it were very lucky to have you here. Now, I know you don't want to hear me speak, so I'm going to keep this really, really quick. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Jonathan Overpeck, or Peck, as he likes to be called, with us here tonight. And I kind of was trying to figure out how to introduce him. I wrote around, and oh my goodness, he has accomplished so many things. I tried to just pick the highlights. So, bear with me. He is the founding co-director of the Institute for the Environment. He is the Thomas R. Brown Distinguished Professor of Science. He's a Regents Professor of Geosciences and Atmospheric Sciences. He's published more than 180 papers in climate and environmental sciences. And on top of that, he's the coordinating lead author for the Nobel Prize winning United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So all of that in one person, we are so thankful to have him here tonight. So I'll turn it over to Kat. I'm hoping the clicker is up here. I need to check that. It's great to be here. And uh, thank you. Great team here. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to be here with all the families, um, both who uh, go to this great school and also some that are hoping to come to this great school and some who are just uh, going to other great schools. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, what's up? I'm getting signals. What I, what I was asked to do is um, do two things. And who knows if I'm going to do that well. Um, but one of the things was to talk sort of about what it's like to have gone through uh, life to this point and gotten to where I am. Um, thinking back to when I was uh, the age of some of the kids in the audience. Um, but also trying to uh, bring it right up to the date. And what are some of the important things that I uh, ran across in that um, grand voyage? Um, and then also to talk about the science of climate change. And, and what I tried to do is put together a talk that's not too long, and I have to shut up and stop um, introducing it. Um, but I'm also going to highlight that I was giving a talk on March 7th, I think, Monday, uh, on the U of A campus, and I'll mention that in a second. Keep an eye open for it. So if you really want to learn about climate change, I'm going to go into a lot more detail in that um, lecture uh, about the climate change parts of this. Okay. But I also highlight, you know, uh, history, science, and communication. And um, history, you know? I think back when I was in school, maybe eighth grade or seventh grade, somewhere along that way, I was really interested in history. And I don't know how I got interested in history, but I think it was partly to my folks, partly just because it was um, interesting to me. Um, and I read tons and tons of books. I was really into reading. And it was all history, and then I found historical novels, and got a little spicy, and I like that. Um, but um, I also um, ran into science. And I'll, I'll sort of show you how I ended up doing that. And I think it's apropos that um, the talk that was given last year was by Mark Kelly, an astronaut. Because really, it was the astronaut business that got me excited about science. Um, but then I mentioned communication because one of the things we often lose track of in um, trying to pick a path through life is how important it is to get the three R's, whatever they are, I don't know, but you know, math and reading and, and uh, writing. And um, yet there's something I think that's just as important that we don't often um, emphasize in uh, K through 12 education or even at the University of Arizona as much as we really should, and that's how to communicate. And a lot of times it's writing, and it's really important to work on your writing. But it's also important to do this um, in debates and public speaking. And if you know something you think people uh, ought to know, you need to be able to communicate it. And I don't have time to really go into that, but I just really, if I had to make a plea for anything, for those in the room who are, you know, thinking, what am I going to do? Am I, you know, I want to grow up? Or um, some of you are thinking, um, if I want to really put my time into something now, there are a lot of things going on in this world, and I think often we're just sort of passive passengers on the way through life, and yet um, we have an opportunity. People want to hear what each other thinks. So I'm going to tell you a little about what I think, and if you really want to hear that, 
Um, again, think about um, that March 7th election. Right? How did I get here? You know, I'll get to this. Uh, I was asked to talk about this Nobel Prize, which I didn't win by myself, um, but won by working in this very large community of scientists who wrote this uh, series of uh, very influential reports and um, about climate, and really getting climate change on the agenda of the world's uh, policy stage. And of course, that all culminated today, anyhow, uh, with the agreement that was reached in Paris last December, um, where all of the countries of the world, uh, or I think pretty much none, have agreed to actually take serious action on climate change. Serious enough? I'm not sure about that. Uh, um, but nonetheless, um, this prize had something to do with that, and that's what I'm going to work up to here. But how did I, how did I get here? Okay. It is the story of astronauts and wanting to be an astronaut. When I was a kid, it was in the 1960s, and back then it was all about going to the moon, and all about every other year, it seems, seeing some unbelievable uh, adventure going on, not to the polar regions or to the mountains of the Earth or to deep down in the ocean, but to outer space. And back then, you know, now we think of it as, oh, we go to space all the time. And yet, I just love to hang out with my friends at U of A in lunar planetary science when they're talking about Europa or, you know, or Pluto or going to an asteroid. That same excitement that I, I remember feeling as a kid, they got me thinking about science and I've got to do science because I know that could get me into outer space. Um, and this guy in particular was a hero of mine growing up. Um, it's, does anyone know who he is? The first American to walk in space. I don't know why they call it walking. First American to float in space. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to show this picture in a minute. He was the first man to walk on the moon. Uh, this is Ed White. If any of you remember Ed White, um, he was uh, destined, at least back in the mid-60s, he was being trained to be one of the first astronauts on the moon. Um, and unfortunately, he had a, um, a, when the, they had an accident, um, the Saturn rocket um, had a big fire, and it killed three astronauts, and he was one of them. Um, but he was my hero in part because um, he lived, he was a neighbor of my cousin's and down in Texas. And when I turned um, eight years old, I got a book about all the different astronauts. And one page had this inscription from him. Um, and it says to Jonathan, uh, he didn't know I ever like people to call him Peck. Uh, to Jonathan, happy birthday on your eighth birthday. May you grow up to be an astronaut. You know, this is like, to me, at that age, nothing could be cooler. Um, you must study hard. Oh, jeez. You know? There's a downside to being an astronaut. Um, and if you look at this guy's resume, unbelievable what he accomplished. He was like an award-winning engineer, you know, son of a gen major general. You know, he was flying planes, you know, like U.S. military aircraft as a kid. Um, but you must study hard. And, you know, it actually got me thinking about studying hard. And I, that's probably when I started to kick into higher gear and starting to take math a little more serious and, and, and uh, science, but also computing, you know? I was really um, an early adopter of computing, okay? Then in 1969, what happened? Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong was the first uh, American, first human to step on the moon, yeah. And I can remember watching this, and I bet you a bunch of people in the audience can remember this. I was at summer camp in, in northern New York at the time, and outdoors watching this on a screen, and it just sh sent shivers up my spine when this occurred, and it was just amazing. Um, and I was sure that, you know, I wanted to be a scientist. I was sure I would be an astronaut. Okay? Something else happened in 1969, however, that had his long forgotten. And it's debated by the Supreme Court. It's in politics all the time. Something called the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And all of this was starting to happen back then. The Environmental Protection Agency was created by uh, Richard Nixon. Um, and before that happened, we had cities where you couldn't even see the sun at night, like in Pittsburgh, where my dad was from. And we had rivers that had dump like that when you put your hand into them. This is a river in, uh, in Ohio that burned many times 
the surface of the water burn because it had so much uh, pollution. And in 1969, they had this really infamous fire that galvanized our politicians in Washington. Even though we had the same kind of dialogue we have going now, Republicans and Democrats agreed that we've got to do something about our environment because it's just getting uh, out of control, polluted. And um, we did something about that. And that brought it, it gave us the Clean Water Act and then the Clean Air Act. Okay, and in 1970, the first Earth Day. And this is a big imprint on my brain, too, because I was doing all the science, and I can remember one of the things we started doing is we used to have all these kits where you got to test our water to see if our water was polluted. And it was chemistry. And it was a lot more um, interesting than just getting the old chemistry set out and mixing chemicals together until you hoped something would explode or catch on fire. <laughs> right? Every, every kid knows that they all follow it. Right. And then another thing happened to me that really had a big impact, and that was my dad was a geologist, okay? And so he had friends who were geologists, including professors, when he was in college. And one of the, the college he went to back east had a museum. And so we'd go see one of his old professors, uh, my brother and I, the younger brother. And uh, every time we'd go visit, you know, it'd be dinosaur fossils and this and that. But this prof old professor friend of his, he didn't work on dinosaurs. He worked on invertebrates, animals without backbones, including these things. Is that what that is? It's an ammonite. Yeah, is that what you think? And you know how old it is? Thousands. Huh? Thousands. Thousands, millions. This is a Cretaceous ammonite. What else lived on Earth during the Cretaceous? You know, 100 million years ago. Dinosaurs. So I was paying attention to dinosaurs, and meanwhile, my brother and I are paying attention to ammonites. Doesn't seem that exciting, right? But believe me, when a famous scientist hands you this shell, in its rock now, and says, you know, imagine this. The oceans a million years ago, a hundred million years ago, were full of these organisms floating around, some were on the, um, on the uh, four of the ocean, some were floating around, but they were all over the place, and there were many different species. And, and you're like, oh, wow. And then he says, here, take it. You know? So I had one just like this, and I moved so many times I couldn't find it, but I was just at the Jenny Mueller show, and I saw it. And I said, that is very cool. I remember that way back when. And all of a sudden I started to realize, I love history, but now maybe I could study the history of the Earth. And that would be even cooler than studying the really short history of humans on Earth. And, and my dad was a geologist, and he gave me a lot of pick, and I was off to the races as a geologist by the time I got to college. Ah, skip forward a while, <laughs> um, and I just stumbled onto something really amazing, to me anyhow. I went into science thinking, I'm a curious person. I just love to find things out. I want to be a detective, but I want to be an earth detective. I want to dig into earth history and find out what those ammonites were doing, those creatures way back when, what the dinosaurs were doing. Why do we have mountains where we have mountains? Why do we have oil deposits? Where did the oil come from? All these things were very interesting to me just for curiosity's sake. And just by serendipity, I ended up studying not just the rocks, but studying how vegetation changed through time, how the earth's climate changed through time. And discovering, being in at the ground floor, so to speak, um, this is really useful because people are really wondering, well, the Earth is warming up. Could this be a natural process? Um, we have computer models that are predicting into the future saying it's going to get really hot or in some places really dry. Are these computer models any good? Maybe we could, how can we test them? We can test them against the geological record. So I was getting to do this stuff, and I did this for a number of years. And um, I got to do a lot of international stuff, by the way. If you liked adventure and doing expeditions to the far reaches of the Arctic, to the Amazon, or the Galapagos, to the Himalaya, you know, I'll just can do that. And I did all that. But along the way, I started to piece together with my colleagues a really good view, I think, of how the Earth's climate system works. And the politicians of the world, the policy leaders of all the countries, said, scientists, give us the best a knowledge about this climate change stuff. What does it really mean for the future and what should policymakers of different countries, of almost 200 countries on this planet, 
What should we be doing about it? And that's what gave rise to this intergovernmental plan on climate change. And um, I didn't start this. I only, all I did in this, really, was I was asked to uh, lead the first paleo climate chapter. You know, the first chapter in this IPCC process that would actually use information from the geological record. And we did that, and it was an amazing uh, work of fun, and uh, my wife's going to attest to how, and she's also a paleoclimatologist, how it was all consuming for several years, leading us just a little part of it, but being part of the bigger part, and packaging it all together so we gave the policymakers of the world the best understanding. And then I remember one morning, after we were all done, we had this plenary meeting where we, we, talk, we gave information to the, the policymakers, and a few of the scientists, I was lucky to be among them, were in Paris at the UNESCO building there, you know, working literally through the night, multiple nights, to give the policymakers all this information. They had to agree on all the wording, word by word, and the scientists had to agree. It was quite an interesting exercise. Come home, it's over. Phew, I can go back to life as normal. And we got a phone call, and I think I was coming out of the shower, and it was an NPR um, journalist, um, who uh, really gave me the phone, and uh, they said, the first thing they said is, hi, how are you, Dr. Overpeck? You know, how does it feel to have won the Nobel Prize? <laughs> and I had no idea, you know, I was like, what, is, you know. <laughs> that doesn't happen because geologists don't get that. And um, even if they did, I'm never really going to be that kind of high, you know, top shelf scientist. And, you know, I said, yeah, uh, the Nobel, the IPCC, what you guys just did, um, was, was being honored by the uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize. And um, whatever I said was going to be on the national radio. And um, I think I said, I didn't go back and check, but I think I said, you know, I, I just blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> I think it's really cool that they connected climate change to peace. Okay? And, um, and I'm sure I said some other things, but to me that was the most amazing thing. And of course, I don't know anyone's followed what's going on in the Middle East lately, but um, a few years ago, uh, right before Eric Spring, a big drought started. And probably drought wasn't the only cause of what happened in Syria, but uh, there were some now scientific papers highlighting how it likely contributed to the displacement of people and the unrest that's unraveled into what we have today. And there are probably going to be many other examples of this. Okay, that's part one. Part two, which I'm going to have to wheel through pretty quick because I'm pretty sure I was too wordly, uh, wordy in, in the first part, is talk a little about climate. And what I really want you to do is think about what's happening now and what it means for the future. And I'm going to show some basic climate change or global warming or greenhouse effect slides. I'm not going to dwell on these. Um, but I want to just show them in case anyone has a question or wants to get in touch with me about them. And then what I'm going to do on that uh, 7th of March lecture is I'm going to go into a, a whole other level uh, of this. I'm still going to be talking to a general audience there. But it's going to be um, more cutting-edge research that hasn't even been published, um, which I'm going to hit at here. So you'll get the main punchlines. Okay? There's that lecture. It's at Centennial Hall. Don't go up at 7. You're never going to get a seat, even though they hold about 1,000 people. These lectures have been going on. It is not just me, um, but there are a lot of people in town who come to these lectures. Um, what's going on now? If you had to say climate, what is the number one thing in the news now? Drought. Drought. Food? I can't hear it. Heating and drying. Heating and drying. Very good. You're, 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 you're listening the same way I do. There's also something like El Nino. Okay. Let's forget about El Nino for now. It's just that uh, there's two types of climate that we experience. One is climate variability, the natural variations, say, in temperature or precipitation, uh, rainfall, snowfall. They go on naturally. They always have, even when those laminates were around, it will always go on in the future. Then there's the part of climate that is what humans are causing. And that's climate change. Okay? El Nino is part of that climate variability. And this is a big El Nino. It should be getting us a lot more rain. It isn't. So we're still hoping as scientists that we get that right. But that's all I'm going to say about that. Except that the reason we're so hopeful that El Nino will give us a lot of rain down here and snow up in the upper basin of the Colorado River is because we have this drought going on. And everyone's been hearing about the drought in California. 
It's in its fourth year now. It doesn't look like the El Nino is going to break the drought, but it certainly is going to help it ameliorate, make it a little less bad. Okay? You can actually ski in, in California this year. What people haven't really been paying attention to, and I want to make sure everyone does, nationally, not just here in the Southwest, is the Colorado River Basin has been in drought too. And it's been in drought since 2000. So we're in the longest drought in the rainy days of thermometer record that the Colorado River's ever seen. Okay? And the Colorado River is important for many reasons. And I'm going to push the wrong button and kill ourselves here. Uh, Okay, the Colorado River goes through seven states, from Wyoming down to us, and Arizona, and Mexico share this water. California gets a whole bunch of it. And the river flows down here to blue, you can see it. But there are two huge reservoirs on it. The biggest reservoirs in the United States, like Powell, a dam uh, by the um, Glen Canyon Dam, and like me here, dam by Hoover Dam. And they hold a lot of water, seven years of water. Uh, almost all the storage on this. Okay, there are a lot of cities, and there are red dots here. Some big cities like Vegas and Denver and Albuquerque and LA and San Diego, Las Phoenix, Salt Lake City. We all use water from this. This is an important river for us. It is our sustainable water supply. Um, people are eating crops from this region now. Nowhere else in the United States are we producing um, nearly as much food for the nation at this point. We're a very rapidly growing part of the country. The Colorado is all of our renewable water supply for nature. Okay? It is our water supply. Okay? The area is Lake Powell, a uh, picture taken a few years ago. It has this famous bathtub ring because Lake Powell hasn't been full since 1999 when it was last uh, full. And Lake Mead was full then too. Now we have, uh, it's about 50% full, it's come up quite a bit, but Lake Mead is only 39% full. And these, these great reservoirs, therefore, are like half full, less than half full. And uh, I wrote this paper a while ago, and I'm harping on this, and my more and more colleagues are harping on this now, that this drought is fundamentally different from previous droughts. It's not because we have less rain or snowfall, it's a little bit of that, like the previous droughts we've had now, this drought is mainly because we have these really wicked hot temperatures. Wicked hot is just a couple degrees warmer than average. But that is causing the atmosphere to be able to hold a lot more moisture and therefore demand a lot more moisture from the snowpack, where it takes it sublimates, takes that water vapor or snow and turns it directly into water vapor from evaporation, from something called evapotranspiration from soils and plants. And the plants are growing six weeks earlier now because of the warm. And as they grow and photosynthesize, they have to take water and release it into the atmosphere. Um, and all of this is really causing the reductions in stream flow in the Colorado River. And yes, it's causing a lot of, and costing a lot of money before the Colorado, uh, California drought, um, just since 2010. Uh, over $40 billion. So there's a real price tag that we pay because of these temperatures. But more importantly, I think there's a, there's a real message here for the future. And the other thing we've heard is that it's hot. 2015 just blew the doors off of any other uh, temperature in the thermometer, global thermometer record. Um, we had a record hot year. The last record hot year was um, in 2010, in 2005, 1998, but there's been a steady progression of record, 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 record. This record broke the record by more than any other record has so far, and they don't hear the news about January 2016. It was the hottest January ever, and it was the, it broke the record for a month um, by more than any other month has ever broken. Alright? So we're seeing clear signs that um, and it, part of this is El Nino, yeah. But, you know, the every El Nino is going to be hotter than the previous El Nino, and that's clear. It's already happened. Acceleration happy. in the temperature and dryness. Yeah, it looks like an acceleration. Okay? Why is it so cold in the Midwest this way? Uh-uh. The polar vortex. That's set up because of um, this high pressure we have over the West now that's denying us the moisture. Instead, the moisture is going up into the Pacific Northwest, 
and then the air is dropping down into the mid-continent east coast, and it's just like last year, it's bringing a lot of cold air that way, and, um, and precipitation in the form of snow. And, uh, but globally, we just have the warmest ever January, by a long ways, okay? And here's a picture of just since uh, the beginning of the last century, 1901 to 2012, just showing you the pattern of warming around the Earth. The white areas are areas where we don't have thermometers, going back to 1901, but we, um, recently the Arctic has been warming more than anywhere else on the planet. But for the places we have thermometer records back to 1901, you can see the colors. Um, wherever it's any color from yellow to red, it's warming. So there's just one spot here in the North Atlantic where it's not warming. This has actually gone away since 2012. Um, the entire planet is now warming, except in the North Atlantic. We know why that's occurring, but the important point is the whole Earth is warming, and lo and behold, that's why scientists have, for the last 45, 50 years, called it global warming. Okay? It's not any, there's no mystery behind it. We're not rocket scientists. Okay? The other thing the IPCC said in the latest iteration, not the one that um, triggered the Nobel Peace Prize, which was in 2007, but the more recent one, is that it's extremely likely that humans are causing at least half of the warming. And I personally think it's a good deal more than that. A lot of scientists agree with me and some don't. So I think what all scientists agree is that it's extremely likely we're 95% sure that humans are causing the bulk of the warming since 1951. Okay? This is the main culprit, CO2. We've all seen this before. There's a seasonal cycle as the planet breathes in the, in the summer. The plants in the northern hemisphere take up CO2, so it goes down a little in the winter. Those plants stop taking up CO2, so it goes up. And so it goes year after year after year after year after year after year. But this long trend from pre-industrial levels that uh, existed back around 1750 to present day, where we're over 400 parts per million, um, this is due to the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, CO2, from humans, primarily due to fossil fuel burning. What happened in 1991, and why did I mark that in this graph? I'll give you a hint, it's happened more than once. And 1901 was the single biggest, uh, 1991 was the single biggest eruption to go off, volcanic eruption, and a tubo. Some of you remember that, some of you weren't born by then, okay? Um, but it was a huge eruption, and I constantly am getting, not constantly anymore, but um, I get e emails and I get people bringing up the topic, well, volcanoes are really the cause of the CO2 increase because we know that volcanoes put up more CO2 in a single year than humans have ever put up. You can see any sign of it? I, I normally, in class, would zoom in on it. You can't even see it. Does it put up particulate too? It goes up particulates well, yes. Yeah. Okay, it was actually cool here. Um, and I was going to talk, very cool talk today, just talking about even in the last um, five years, there have been more eruptions than people previously thought. And lower levels of volcanic aerosols, and they get up in the atmosphere and they reflect sunlight back. So they actually act against the warming of the greenhouse gases. So that's one reason why maybe the warming hasn't as great as it could be. I'll show you another reason it hasn't. And I don't want to get into this other than to say, We've always had a greenhouse effect on this planet. Without the greenhouse effect, the planet would be frozen solid. Very small natural concentrations of greenhouse of, of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere is like 280 parts per million, teeny amounts. What it does though is it traps the radiation and lets the radiation coming from the sun through the atmosphere, which hits the earth, and then it changes its wavelength and re-radiates out to um, space. But the greenhouse gases trap some of that heat in the atmosphere. Geologically, the sun is pretty constant, um, and the radiation coming in should re meet, uh, match the radiation going out. We can measure that with satellites, and we find now that there's a lot less radiation going out because it's getting trapped in the atmosphere, and over 90% of the heat isn't even in the atmosphere, it's going into the ocean. Thank goodness for the ocean, because otherwise it would be a heck of a lot warmer here. If you want to think of what happens if the greenhouse effect goes, runs away, think Venus, where a spacecraft has to have a window made out of diamond to withstand just a few days on this planet's surface. 
Okay? Here is the ocean heat content. Just to show you, we have many measures of this. It's not just atmospheric temperature. And I can't even show you all the stuff that we've got. But this is the heat content of the ocean steadily going up. And some of you have talked about how warming has slowed down recently. And of course, 2015 proves that's a bunch of bull. But you know, the, this record also shows that what happens periodically is the ocean takes up more heat. These different lines are from different data sources. Sometimes the oceans take up more heat. That means the atmosphere has less heat that given year. So there's a little yin and yang. But the ocean can hold a lot more heat. And that's why when we stabilize the greenhouse gases, eventually we will, I believe, um, the, we will stay at the same temperature for centuries. Because the ocean will start to slow as the atmosphere starts to cool. The ocean will just release heat and to keep it warm until we get a new equilibrium, maybe a thousand or more years from now. Okay? As the ocean warms up, we predict all this stuff was predicted long ago, before I was even a grad school student. It's all happening. Um, as the ocean heats up, it's like a hot air balloon. If you, if you warm up that balloon, it has to expand, and the ocean is expanding, and sea level should be rising. We can measure that in space. We can measure the tide gauges. Um, it's very clear, no matter how we measure it, that sea level is going up around the world. That's about 10 inches now, is it? Uh, it is about 10. Who wants to do that conversion of millimeters to? Uh, it's about 200 millimeters so far. How many inches is that? Okay, excellent. Not very much. How much do you think it could go up by the end of the century? We don't know for sure, but I'll tell you what's happening now. We think most of the sea level rise until recently was due to the expanding ocean. Uh, it turns out that um, small part is due to melting glaciers. Most glaciers around the world are melting. But the biggest component of sea level rise to come is uh, water locked up in polar ice sheets, Antarctica and Greenland. And that component now is half of this. So that's the thing that's really scary us, is that the polar ice sheets are starting to lose mass at an accelerating rate. I'm not going to show you that, but I could. Um, and because of that, we're starting to worry that by the end of the century, we could get about three or four feet, maybe even more, of sea level rise. What part of the U.S. government takes that most seriously, even during Republican administrations? <laughs> the Navy. The Navy doesn't talk about, oh, I don't know about climate change, I don't believe it. They are planning on a meter of sea level rise, perhaps two, by the end of this century. They are planning on the Arctic Ocean opening up. Our Navy is reorienting not just to Asia, but to the Arctic. Okay? And I've heard this firsthand from naval admirals. Okay? Other things happening that are really clear. Snowpack is receding around the northern hemisphere. So this is the area of snow um, on average uh, each spring, and it's going down. And this is what's hammering us. Because of the warming, it isn't because there's less and less precipitation. It's because there's more and more warming melting that snow. And as it melts the snow in the upper Colorado River basin, it means less snow going into the river and more going into plants. Um, or other ways into the atmosphere. And a big thing uh, is that, beep, come on, um, the Arctic sea ice is also uh, declining. I think this year we're going to see a smashing record for the area of summer sea ice. This winter is the lowest sea ice we've seen in the record so far. We just found that. Okay. Um, and the IPCC, again, remember, climate scientists are not rocket scientists. They sort of said, everyone in the room probably can, can make, this, make this assertion. If the CO2 keeps going up, will the warming stop? And no, it's got to keep warming, as long as we put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. CO2 is the big one, but there's methane, there's nitrous oxide, there are a whole bunch of others okay, that trap heat in the atmosphere. Thus, we have choices. We can adapt to this change. We can mitigate. Fancy word for it. We can stop emitting the greenhouse gases. Or we can do both. We're already doing both. There's been a growth of renewable energy that is far exceeding everyone's um, expectations. 
um, in recent couple of years um, that really um, is very encouraging, both in our nation and in other nations. Some nations, such as Denmark, I believe, now can power their entire country of wind in some months. Okay? But here's the rub. The question is, um, what can we adapt to and what can't we adapt to? We need to figure that out soon to make sure that we don't end up with what we cannot adapt to. Okay? That's where science becomes really important. That's where public discourse, remember the communication part of this, comes in? And if it's just the scientists saying, hey, pay attention, this is important, it isn't going to happen. This is where a democracy has to behave like a democracy. Okay? Because we have choices in how long we want this planet to go, how dry we want the Southwest to be. Okay? That's not for me as a scientist to tell anybody. It's for us as a democracy to decide. And it's not, all just as it's not for me to say, it's also not for the oil patch. I'm a geologist, remember, I have friends in the oil patch. Some of that industry really wants to tell our government what to do. And the people have to decide this, right? So, here are our choices. Um, this is a way of looking at global temperature rise that we already have had here. You've seen it portrayed in a different way. But really what we've seen so far is nothing compared to what we'll see over the course of this coming century. If we let business as usual uh, occur, the average of all 39 models that are used to create this suggests that we'll have a 7 degree Fahrenheit warming or 4 degrees C warming at the plant. We're, we're, we're at 1 degree so far, thanks to 2015. If we really cut back on our emissions, probably as much as we any scientist thinks we can really do it, we'll only have another degree warming beyond what we've had already. Okay? What we agreed on in Paris is in between this. Okay? So in Paris, we didn't really agree to solve the problem. We agreed to make a step in solving the problem. And we didn't commit, right? All we did is say we're going to do it, but there's no binding commitments. Well, how does that translate those two choices? Translates into um, a globe that looks like this, just like in the instrumental or our thermometer record, the, God, I wish I didn't do that, I'm sorry. Um, my fingers are too fat. Um, the uh, continents will warm up more than the ocean because the ocean can mix the temperature down with the other factors. And even with a one degree warm, one more, one degree, another degree of warming, we'll still get more like a degree and a half over the continent where we live. Whereas if we just have business as usual go, the average of all the models says, these are degrees C, by the way, multiply by 1.8 to get degrees F. But we'll really cook this continent of ours. Okay? Some models suggest way more warming than this. And I'll mention some of that in my next talk um, on campus when we look at individual models. This is not the worst case I'm showing you here. This is sort of the average case. Okay? This is what I'm really going to harp on and talk about when I'm talking at U of A in Centennial Hall. I'm going to give you the punchline. We're pretty sure now, based on this study and, and uh, other work, that for every degree of warming we get, degree C, the question mark is supposed to be a degree symbol, we're going to get somewhere between, uh, well, 6.5% plus or minus 3.5%, so somewhere between 3 and 10%. Reduction in stream flow, meaning river flow, Colorado River. So we already over this drought since, 19, since 2000 have averaged 19% down per over you know every year, every year. Okay, um, and we think about 10% of that is due to the warming we've had. So this is already happening. We can't explain why if we're getting so much reduction in river flow. But we think it's because we're at the high end of this range, in other words, 10% per degree C warming or more. Okay? All right, I'm almost done. But I couldn't get a talk about giving you the whole picture. Okay? My last talk two weeks ago was in Vegas, and I talked about the Colorado River there to uh, a room full of lawyers and the top level water managers for the Colorado. Um, but I also learned that lots of people can talk about climate change and uncertainty in terms of odds. Here are the odds for the types of climate change we will get in southwest 
North America than you were we live in New Mexico. And believe me, if you want to see worse, just go south. They're going to get the hardest. Hit the hardest. But we're almost, in terms of the United States, I think we're going to get the hardest. Warmer, it's a sure bet. You can bet your house on this. It's already happening. The models all agree. The physics all agree. There's basically no reason not to think it's going to get warmer. Because it's going to get warmer, we're going to see less snow. Excellent enough. Not perfect guys, because maybe we're missing something about precipitation going up. Over the last 100 years, there's been absolutely no increase or decrease in the overall trend of precipitation. So I think if you're a betting person, you don't think precipitation is going to change. It's only going to be the temperature having its effect, and that means less snow. It also means drier soils. It's also happening. Everything in Europe here is happening. Less winter snow and rain. Good odds of that. Again, we've had some really interesting miracle May last year. The wettest May we've ever seen. Maybe there's something we're missing there. You wouldn't want to bet the house on that. Maybe only your car. Maybe not your brand new car. Um, less water in the rivers. Good odds. Because of the warming, its effect on, its effect on snow and soils and vegetation, I would say, you know, that's a very good bet. And it certainly is happening. Everything here is happening. Skipping the more intense rain, it's not happening. But right? in the southwest, and yet it's happening in many other parts of the world. We think the reasons Hurricane or uh, Sandy was so devastating, we think some of these winter storms, they're, they're snowing more intensely because the atmosphere has more moisture in it. We're getting more drought. More severe drought, or very hot drought because of the warmer. Okay, it's happening. So to conclude, if you want to think about what's the future of the Southwest, Arizona, Tucson, it's really what's been happening. Only a lot more of it if we allow greenhouse gases to continue to be emitted at the rate they're being emitted. If we continue on a path that is fueled by fossil fuels. Okay. Pretty darn good bets. You didn't see any bad bets in that list, right? Um, continued warming should really reduce our flows to the Colorado. And when I give my talk on the 7th, I'm going to be talk convincing the audience that if we do not curb our greenhouse gas emissions, this century will see 50% or more of our Colorado water literally go up in vapor to the atmosphere. Our very life blood our only sustainable water supply is going to be hammered. So when people say, so what's the big deal about a couple degrees warmer? Well, you can tell them, hey, it's my water supply. Most of it. Okay? Um, continuing warming will also increase the odds of drought. Not droughts that last two years, three years, four years, but droughts that we're like we're in now that might go on for decades. We've had those droughts in the past. If you go to the Four Corners, everyone's seen some of the ancient dwellings, ancestral club and dwellings up there, where people moved. We think they moved in part because it got too dry. I think also it got too hot. Not as high as we have now, but hotter. They started to get some hot droughts back then, too, for natural reasons. The droughts we have now are hot because of us. And if we get these multi decadal droughts and the warming, we are really cooked. People get upset about that when I, I tweet a lot and I say that, you know, we're going to get cooked. And I get some pretty decent fan mail for me. Um, but I believe that's a good metaphor because the water is going to be vaporized from the sources that we need put in the atmosphere. Isn't that what happens when you cook? You boil some water away? Okay. Doesn't that mean the water will precipitate somewhere further east? Yeah, precipitation will go up somewhere else, yeah. but not here. Not here. Right. Yeah, and you know, there's an old adage that wet places will get wetter, dry places will get drier. That's probably not true, but in these dry belts, it should get, to, it should get drier or not change. But to think it's going to get wetter is making a bet on something you probably wouldn't want to make that on. Okay? The news isn't all bad. Now, what I'd like to do, and I'm going to do this in my Centennial Hall talks, I'm really, I'm going to end with a lot of reasons for optimism. And I've already mentioned a couple here, and I don't have time to really do this. But the important thing to realize 
is that we know what the problem is with time left to solve. So the metaphor I like to use is a medical metaphor. And it means that um, if you have a really bad disease that's treatable, it is really nice when the doctor says, I know what you have, and I've got the treatment. Okay? Because you're going to be okay. All right? We now know what our problem is. We know how to treat it. So you shouldn't go home tonight feeling depressed because I've convinced you that our water supply is being cooked. <laughs> And then it's all downhill from here if we allow greenhouse gases to be emitted without any, with, you know, with abandon. We don't slow it down. Okay? The other thing you should really realize is if we decide to act to solve our problem, Arizona's going to be a big winner. Why is that? Because the industry of the future, the energy of the future is going to be renewable energy, and a lot of that's going to be solar and wind. And what state in the United States of America has the biggest solar energy potential? We will be the Saudi Arabia of North America. We will do this with northern Mexico. We'll do this with southern California. We'll do this with Nevada. This will be the energy mecca of our country. It will no longer be Texas, although Texas has a lot of wind generation and solar potential, too. Will they seize that? I don't know. They are already generating more uh, wind energy than anywhere else. So maybe Texas will be part of this. The Southwest will be the winner. Okay? And we'll solve our problem. Thank you. Everyone should go home and go to bed. No, I have a question. I didn't like my metaphor. No, I like it. I'm glad. I like doctors too. But, but, if you're a doctor or some treat a patient or a disease that has not been completely diagnosed, that's not right. And from everything I know, and let me tell you, I'm not conservative. I don't see this global warming thing that kind of a lot of the women scientifically. Um, and it's a, it's a political agenda not a scientific agenda, and there are thousands of well-qualified experts in the world who totally disagree with the conclusions of your uh, governmental uh, medication papers to you for health problems. Name five climate scientists who disagree with what I say. I know of about three. Okay, I'll tell you, I know one of them personally. Dr. Benjamin Herman, PhD, Professor Emeritus. I know Ben well. University of Arizona. Okay. At the top of the list of what are considered deniers. Ben is not a climate scientist. He's a meteorologist. He's the head. No, he's not the head. He's retired. Problem. <laughs> it's a meteorological problem. It's weather. This is not, we're talking climate. Okay, number two. Freeman Dyson. Physicist. He's, yeah, he's not a climate scientist. So if you want me to, well, next well, time you get sick, well, come to me. I'm a climate scientist. I can tell you what's wrong with you. You have I, this, the people need to know. This, this is, is not a political agenda. Can I make a comment? But let's move on. If you think it's a political agenda, go out and, 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 and move. $173 million dollars. He was a coal mining engineer. Okay. He was a coal mining engineer. My heart would be I'm getting rich because of what I'm doing. Is this what you know, or is this what you want to believe? This is what I read. The of geophysical right, but is it what you want to believe? No. Okay. There's, there's room for this room. I want to ask, I want people to ask questions here that are not okay. political, okay? Uh, last time I was aware of 50 million years ago, we got 450 parts per million in the early days. What was the temperature like at that time before the scientific data? 50 million years ago, the early, I think it was the Miocene or the Eocene, we were at 50 based on sampling material. It was very warm. One of the things we highlighted in our IPCC chapter back in 2007 was how, if you go back in Earth's history, whenever we had higher CO2 it was than today, it was... Historically, it's validated uh, higher CO2, CO2 corresponds to higher global temperature. Yes, very clearly. Okay. And um, 
you know, the Russians um, back in the day, before um, they had good computers, had a lot of good mathematicians, and they were very interested in this fact. And they were trying to, you know, they, they actually were looking at these ancient periods and plotting temperature versus CO2 in the atmosphere. And you get a pretty straight line. Now we know that it's a little more complicated than that, but it's pretty darn clear as CO2 goes up and over Earth's history, um, it gets warmer, as CO2 goes down, it gets cooler. Do we know why it was higher uh, CO2 with the bacteria 50 million years ago? Yeah, on those time scales, it has to do not with, of course, human emissions. Right. It has to do with changes in the ratio of CO2 production from volcanic, oh, volcanic air activity and weather, which absorbs, takes the CO2 and turns it into rock okay. eventually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the rise in the ocean temperatures, what effect are you seeing that that has on the uh, biodiversity and the effects on the blue chain? Wow. We should turn it over to my wife, who's Julie Cole, who is the director of the Biosphere 2 Ocean and does a lot of work on the ocean. In the oceans, the warming is having big effects on um, the biota. It's having effects particularly on, on near shore environments and coral reefs where a lot of oak marine life starts out. Um, but there's something else going on in the ocean we didn't even talk about, which is ocean acidification. Um, and it's this double whammy of those two things. This is, she gives this talk, not me. Um, and pollution and dynamite fishing and a whole bunch of other things that is really, and overfishing, are really wreaking havoc with the um, marine food chain. Does that sound all right? So what are we doing with the green food chain? Oh, uh, so there's several really problematic trends in the nation. You mentioned acidification, but there's also a loss of oxygen, which is kind of a complicated chemical and has a reaction to the oxygenation. Um, there is stratification that's keeping nutrients from rising to the surface, and so that's creating problems with it. As you warm the surface, it becomes more stable and it's hard to get the nutrients up. So there's just a uh, a lot of different trends all kind of moving in a really bad direction in the ocean. Yeah, they've never been. Okay. Let you guys answer this question, but I just want to make sure no one under the age of, uh, I see you're only 20. Uh, any under the age of 20? No one? Okay, you can go. <laughs> uh, what can we do aside from voting for people who will help move us in the right direction? Um, what can we do? Well, you know, I brought up the. Um, late 60s and early 70s, and I know you were working on that. And, um, but you know, back then, people really got serious. I mean, what happened on campuses, I mean, the Vietnam War was going on, it was hard to, like, separate out from that and, and civil rights, but there was a lot of demands made by the public for action on these burning rivers and the, the horrible air pollution we had at the time. And so um, I'm not advocating going out and protesting, per se, but I think the public has to start talking about this more than they're talking about, say, what Donald Trump said last night. You know, this is a real issue of our time, and particularly for the um, younger people in the audience, our kids and grandkids, are the ones who are going to have to deal with the problem that we and our parents created. So um, we can't just be, you know, um, we can all go to the voting booth, but we have to get more people interested in doing it, perhaps. And we have to communicate so, you know, it doesn't get drowned out by, you know, the uh, Fox News and Wall Street Journal and things that, by the way, are all, you know, it's a foreign company that owns those. Why are they telling our population what to do about this issue? Okay. Yeah. Speaking of what can be done in the future, do you know any work that's being done in geophysical engineering to not just produce less CO2, but actually sequester or capture that? Yeah, there's a lot of research going on in that area, um, and called geoengineering is a term that's used. Um, if we can actually figure out how to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, that would be huge. Um, we can do that as smokestacks. 
but can we go and take the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere and sequester that? Um, you've got a lot of, you know, they don't know how to do that in an energy effective way. Uh, and then we have to also figure out where we're going to put the CO2 once we've got it. But we have ideas on how to do that. Um, but none of them are very cost effective at this point or energy effective. In other words, you have to use, you have to generate so much energy to do this. Um, but there's a lot of research going on. There are some other ideas of uh, geoengineering, which is how to cool the planet artificially to compensate. A lot of uh, ethical issues with that, but there's also a lot of uncertainty about the science behind it, much less certainty than this stuff I've been talking about, and there could be a lot of unintended consequences. So um, even though scientists are researching it, nobody is up, very few people are up saying we should consider it seriously. But it's there in case something really bad all of a sudden starts to happen, like an ice sheet starts to really go fast. Is somebody doing a calculation, say, in a utopian future, we figure out fusion, and so we've got, you know, in essence, unlimited energy. Obviously, the sun is a fusion device as well. But if CO2 sequestration is so energy intensive, would that balance out thermodynamically? Well, because you're creating heat when you do fusion as well. Yeah, I think that would be a problem in terms of the heat. You know, people have argued about you know, that and some other technologies. Um, the big question is if we could develop a, a non-carbon unlimited energy, could we sequester the CO2? I think a lot of people in the room are used to technologies and science saving the day, and we put a man on the moon, we can do anything. But we don't know how to do this yet. So hoping that we will develop that in time is just that. It's a hope. And therefore, it's a risky hope, perhaps. Okay. I'll repeat it. I want to phrase this question. No one's talking about the amount of methane being produced by production of meat for consumption, even at the level that you want to develop meat pricing. Uh, but isn't it true there's about 600 gallons of water in a single hammer, and that we're also using a lot of the environment to grow grains to produce cattle? Yeah, um, that definitely is true. Um, there's a lot of embedded, there's more energy production embedded in meat than any other food source. Um, and there's a lot of water. Your methane production. And then you get the methane production as well. Um, when, I, when I say energy embedded, you know, you got the methane coming from the rumen um, organism, the cow. <laughs> But you also have a lot of energy going into making the feed for that cow. And so it, it is a serious um, problem. Um, and it is one of the ways you could curtail greenhouse gas emissions, is to have less consumption of meat. So, so, when so that ask, is true. So when people ask, what can we do, couldn't we say, eat one less hamburger? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in our family, we're, doing, we're eating a lot less meat. Um, we, we haven't stopped eating meat, but, um, and, you know, when I go away, I, I just need to hand over. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, yeah, you know, you know, if we all stop eating a little, if we cut back our meat, that would be, that would be helpful. 20% of the effect is caused by cattle. 20% of global warming is attributable. Yeah, I don't know the numbers. I don't think it's that large. Do you know? It, it depends on how you look at it. So it depends on whether you count deforestation to create pasture sure, as part of the equation, or if you don't count that as part of the equation. And exactly. in some parts of the world, it, it counts, and in some parts of the world, it doesn't. Yeah, if we leave, eat lower on the food chain, we will help solve this problem. Beef and lamb are the number one you know, emitters, and then everything below that is much less. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind, too. It's pushing the chicken for you. So now be careful if you do that. <laughs> Any other questions? It's late for some of the kids in the room, sure. Oh, right. What you got? Because uh, I've heard people say that, oh no, if this ever happened again, uh, ever happened before, I mean, not the history of human, but the history of Earth, the, the warming. Like, the, uh, the Earth is turned to warm. Because I've heard some people say, 
it's not, I mean, global warming is eventually, it will happen. It's just that we're speeding it up. Uh, I don't know if it will happen because, as we were talking about before, um, the warm periods in Earth history, geologic history, were caused by much slower processes. It's, you know how um, the Earth is made up of plates? You, you know, yeah. often populized as continental drift. Well, anyhow, it's the, how those plates are interacting, how fast they're moving, controls the amount of uh, volcanism on the planet, net global volcanism. And that controls the amount of CO2 on million year time scales. And then that also controls the rate of mountain building and other phenomena that control the rate of CO2 uh, withdrawal from the atmosphere via um, weathering. Um, so I suppose if you say the Earth is 4 billion years old or whatever, and we got another few billion years to go, um, Chances are we're going to have some periods that are hotter than we're going to make the Earth in the next hundred years. Okay, but that is um, completely a separate issue, you know, because right now we're here and we're warming this planet up at a much faster rate than Mother Nature has ever probably done. It. So it's true of humans speeding it up. Well, we—that's what really is different here. We're speeding it up, you know, astronomically from what the um, Mother Nature can do. Please give Dr. Overpeck one more. Thanks for coming, everybody.